They just don't make candy like they used to. From gum made into weird shapes to ultra-sour treats, the candy from our childhood brings us an instant rush of nostalgia. Here are the retro candies we miss the most. Bazooka gum was hard as a rock, and the flavor lasted less than a minute. But what else could you buy with the five cents in your pocket left over from lunch? It made your jaw ache, but those few seconds of flavor and the resulting bubbles you could blow were totally worth it. Plus, there was the novelty of the comics inside featuring the adventures of Bazooka Joe and his trademark eye patch. That alone made this classic candy a favorite of kids everywhere. Jerry, don't do that. That is so annoying. <laughs> Bazooka Joe. Even though this classic gum, which was first sold in the 40s, is still on shelves in some stores, it's virtually unrecognizable. The red, white, and blue packaging has been replaced with pastel colors, and those comics we loved have been gone since 2012. In their place, you'll now find puzzles and brain teasers, with codes to unlock online video games. There was probably no candy parents hated more than Whistle Pops, the sucker that actually was a working whistle when you first unwrapped it. As some respite for adult ears everywhere, the holes closed up and the whistle stopped functioning not long after it hit your tongue. The the Though the original Whistle Pops were discontinued, Chupa Chups has reintroduced them under the name Melody Whistle Pops. Despite their coolness, however, they're nowhere near as widely available as they were once upon a time. You can still find them if you're willing to look, but we're still waiting for a wider comeback. In the early 90s, there was one surefire way to prove your toughness to your friends, the Cry Baby Challenge. The packaging claimed the extreme sourness of this bubblegum lasted about 40 seconds, but it seemed so much longer than that when it was your cheeks taking the beating. You ruled the playground if you put more than one in your mouth at the same time, but you couldn't let anyone see the tears in your eyes. Kids still love to test themselves with sour candy, but unfortunately Cry Baby is no longer the king of the playground. It's hard to find crybaby gum today, maybe because today's parents remember their own playground pain and don't want their kids going through the same thing. There was literally nothing satisfying about eating candy buttons. All the fun was in mindlessly peeling the brightly colored sugar dots off the paper. Unfortunately, that meant you usually ate about as much paper as you did candy. Candy buttons by Neko disappeared when the company went out of business in 2018. The new owners are making the candy buttons on Neko's old equipment, but they're not as widely available as they once were, and they're nowhere near as cool. If you have a craving for these retro candies, your best bet is a specialty shop or vintage candy store. Kids today just don't have the patience for Jaw Busters, which were first sold in 1919. Willy Wonka's everlasting gobstoppers had nothing on these candies. You didn't chew them, you didn't really suck on them either. You just kind of held them in your mouth until they disappeared or your cheek went numb, whichever happened first. Plus, the flavor tended to wear off after about five minutes, so you sometimes forgot it was even in there until you started drooling on yourself. Did anyone ever actually get to the end of one of these everlasting jaw buster candies? We sure didn't, and we'd like them to make a comeback so we can try again. Once upon a time, you could get two different kinds of candy cigarettes at your local drugstore. One was pink bubblegum wrapped in paper, and the other was hard, chalky white candy. Plus, they were usually lined up next to bubblegum cigars and shredded bubblegum that was supposed to look like chewing tobacco. All designed to make you feel like a grown-up as you worked on your daily sugar intake. Of course, that was back before the big anti-smoking pushes and before studies began to come out linking candy cigarettes to smoking as an adult. Although plans to ban candy cigarettes entirely in the U.S. never quite followed through, the damage was done. Today, only a few companies still manufacture the treat, but now under the name of candy sticks. Every time a child of the 90s saw that well-known paint can on a gas station counter, their mom knew she was in trouble. If they had a dime in their pocket, they were getting one of those pieces of bubblegum. Their mouth, lips, and probably hands would be brightly colored within minutes. And yes, that was the entire point of this candy. It's got the word splash in its name for a reason. We're pretty sure parents everywhere rejoiced when tongue splashers went off the market, but you can still buy something similar today under the name Double Bubble Painters. It's just not as cool when it doesn't come in a paint can. To be completely honest, when Ouch Bubblegum was popular, it wasn't about the actual chewing of the gum. The taste was nothing special and some of us may have actually thrown away the gum as soon as it was opened. No, it wasn't the gum that was wanted. It was the package it came in. 
Those awesome tin cases made to look like bandage containers were used to store everything from change to rocks to actual bandages. Sometimes you'd even refill it with bubble gum that actually tasted good. Hubba Bubba still makes ouch bubble gum, but the tin case is gone, rendering it completely useless in the minds of many. If you ask a child of the 90s what the best flavor of Laffy Taffy was, there's no question they'll tell you Sparkle Cherry. Something about that crunch of the glitter sprinkles and the sweetness of the stretchy taffy made this a delightfully satisfying treat. Each chewy piece is exactly 50% Laffy and 50% Taffy. Unfortunately, while Laffy Taffy is still widely available, it's not very easy to find Sparkle Cherry in stores anymore. You can still order it in bulk online if you have a major craving, but it's not as affordable as it once was. These days, you can expect to pay around $2 for each stick of Sparkle Cherry Laffy Taffy. Nostalgia ain't cheap. Yes, runts are still widely sold in stores, but the runts sold in stores today are nothing like the runts of our childhoods. They're still in the cute fruit shapes we remember, but the less observant runts fan might not notice that the shapes and flavors aren't all the same. The original runts came in orange, cherry, banana, strawberry, and lime. Throughout the years, they've added and removed different flavors, and today they also include apple and grape, and lime is no longer available. These candy bars were only around for a little while. They debuted in 1989, and they vanished in 1990. Sure, the commercials were vaguely annoying, but we were willing to forgive for this delicious treat. So what happened? Some say the family behind parent company Mars had something against peanut butter, so they pulled the product despite its success. We don't know if that's true or not, but even if Mars execs don't like peanut butter, they could have left some for the rest of us. We still miss that combination of salty peanut butter, crispy, crunchy cookie bits, and chocolate coating. BB Max, we mean peanut butter. Never before has marketing been so honest as it was with garbage candy. They came in little plastic garbage cans, just like the name suggests. When you popped the top, you found hard but powdery, tart but sweet candy in shapes like bottles, shoes, and fish bones. You can still get them from Canada, but they're not quite the same. The original candy came from Tops and was the brainchild of the same person responsible for Garbage Pail Kids. There definitely seemed to be a theme, and we do miss those little garbage cans. They were handy for some post-indulgence toy storage, and while we might be more likely to keep paper clips in them today, they were still undeniably neat. Astro Pops had it all. They were sweet, lasted forever, and to a kid, they seemed to be as big as your head. Plus, what kid doesn't love space? You might not have known this when you were little, but Astro Pops had some serious space cred. They were invented in 1963 by some actual rocket scientists who quit their day jobs and decided to make candy for a living. They created special equipment to make the multicolored rocket-shaped pop and completed the career change of a lifetime. Astro Pops were around for decades after their space race era birth. They were discontinued in 2004, but there's good news if you still have a craving. A longtime Astro Pop fan negotiated the purchase of the rights to the candy in 2010. After rebuilding all the specialty equipment needed to make them, Astro Pops were reborn. You can find them in specialty candy shops now, and fingers crossed, they'll be more widely available someday. You're familiar with Pop Rocks, right? It's the candy that was fun as a kid and hurts your teeth as an adult. Pop Rocks hit the shelves in 1976, and they were so popular that General Foods released a spin-off candy called Space Dust. Unfortunately, Space Dust was never as popular as its rocky counterpart. It was essentially a more powdery version of Pop Rocks, but the combination of a distinctly drug-like appearance and a name similar to Angel Dust meant that parents weren't fans of it. Space Dust was renamed Cosmic Candy, but the original name still haunted it. The hype over Space Dust made it super popular for a while, but the whole thing just sort of fizzled out. Here's a fascinating footnote, though. There's a good reason for the space theme. Pop Rock's creator William Mitchell also invented Tang, the orange drink made for astronauts that was later marketed to families. Bonkers were everything that candy should be, including fun. If you're old enough to remember Saturday morning cartoons, you'll probably remember the commercials. They starred boring-looking people who eat a piece of bonkers candy, then get hit with a giant piece of fruit, much to their amusement. While it didn't exactly make sense, it definitely made an impression. The soft vanilla and fruit chews were hugely popular in the 1980s and 1990s, until even they were eventually discontinued. Fans were devastated, but there's good news. Bonkers fruit candy isn't back yet, but there's hope for a revival. 
In 2018, Leaf Brands announced they were almost ready to bring this old classic back to the market. They not only purchased the rights to the candy, but tracked down the original inventor to get some inside information about how Bonkers is made. They dipped back into the old formulas and even took a crack at redesigning the machinery specially made to churn out Bonkers. Does reptile meat mixed with fortified wine sound appetizing to you? If not, then you'll absolutely understand why these old-school comfort foods aren't very popular anymore. The 1950s were a time of some truly weird food creations. Some of them never quite made it out of the decade, while others have managed to hang around in some capacity. Tuna noodle casserole wasn't invented in the 50s, as the recipe first appeared in 1930 in a magazine published in the Pacific Northwest. It was popular in the region well into World War II, where it gained popularity as a cheap, quick dish. By the 50s, it had spread to the Midwest, where it became a mainstay on many dinner tables for decades to come. That is, until the late 90s and early 2000s spelled its downward trend. It was the primary ingredient that spelled this casserole's end. After decades of continuous growth, sales of canned tuna began to see a decline in the 90s due to growing concerns about its healthfulness and sustainability. A tuna casserole. Yes. May I serve? Please. Many comfort foods today are pretty much ubiquitously popular across much of the United States. But in the pre-internet era, it wasn't uncommon for comfort foods of decades past to never spread outside a particular region. That was the case for chicken a la king. At the turn of the 20th century, it was both a comfort food and an upscale dish popular at restaurants. It features diced chicken with mushrooms and peppers served in a cream sauce and poured over toast. While the name may sound a little French, it was likely born and bred in the Big Apple. New York! Between 1910 and the 1960s, Chicken a la King appeared on more than 300 menus and restaurants around the city, but by the late 70s, it had already begun to fade. Long before a bowl of cereal became a breakfast table staple, another simple dish held a similar place. Milk toast traces its origins at least as far back as the 1800s. It starts with a slice of toast, spread with butter, torn into pieces, and sprinkled with cinnamon and sugar. Then it's topped with milk that's been heated on the stove and seasoned with salt. It's tough to say exactly where this simple dish got its start, but it is known that as late as the 1930s, recipes for milk toast were included in cookbooks. While you may not hear about it much these days, a similar recipe is a popular childhood lunch item in Hong Kong. It's called condensed milk toast, and it consists of toast spread with condensed milk and butter. In the 1990s, Sloppy Joes were a staple of lunchroom cafeterias and potluck dinners. But this messy creation was actually invented decades earlier. Some think it was created in 1930, when a cook named Joe from Sioux City, Iowa mixed loose meat with tomato sauce and served it on bread. Others claim that it originated at Sloppy Joe's Bar in Key West, Florida. And still others believe that it was originally a take on a classic Cuban dish, either Picadillo or Ropa Vieja, and that it was being served in Havana as early as 1917. In any case, Sloppy Joe saw a rise in their popularity at the end of the 20th century, but then they all but disappeared elsewhere by the end of the 90s. While the culprit behind its demise isn't exactly clear, it likely made its way out of cafeterias due to campaigns to reform school lunch programs. I made them extra sloppy for you! <laughs> Fondue first appeared in cookbooks in the 18th century in France and Belgium, but the term has its origins in Switzerland from around the same time, when it was used to refer to a meal made from bread that was often stale, dipped in cheese to make it soft, and helped stretch rations during the winter. Fondue exploded in popularity in the United States in 1964 after it was featured in the Alpine-themed restaurant in the Swiss Pavilion at the World's Fair. Then Switzerland's cheesemakers banded together to create a union and prevent competition. They launched a marketing campaign in the 70s that featured actors dressed in skiing outfits, dipping bread, meats, and more into creamy pots of melted cheese. Home fondue pots then grew in popularity, and soon fondue house parties were also a growing trend. 
But like most trends, it faded away by the end of the decade, though it popped back up in the early 2000s. You can still dip all manner of appetizers in creamy cheese at many fondue restaurants, but DIY kits have once again disappeared from most store shelves. Do you... Fondue? White gravy was already a popular cheap military ration by the time of World War I when chipped beef made its way into the recipe. These thin slices of smoked, salted beef were served on a slice of toast and then smothered in gravy to make a hot, simple dish to fill soldiers' stomachs. While it was gaining new and alternative ingredients, like parsley for flavor or tomato sauce to thicken the dish, chipped beef also made its way into the mainstream. Variations were a cheap meal for families during the Great Depression and later as a popular breakfast dish at diners in Pennsylvania. Some national chains have even offered it on their menus. But while chipped beef lives on primarily as a military dish, even they've altered the recipe to make it healthier, usually treating the chipped beef for very lean ground beef or ground turkey. Long before DoorDashers were racing through the street, TV dinners were a mainstay for American families short on time and looking for simple solutions. Frozen dinners as a concept were actually created before households had a microwave to heat them in. In the mid-1920s, Clarence Birdseye developed a machine that could freeze packaged fish to help it stay safe longer. A couple of decades later, frozen dinners hit the scene, but only as meals served on airlines. It would take until 1953 for 260 tons of frozen leftover Thanksgiving turkey to inspire a Swanson salesman to create partitioned aluminum trays filled with turkey and sides to freeze and sell to the public. And thus, TV dinners were born. The frozen meal industry saw rapid growth from the mid-50s until the turn of the 21st century, but 2008 marked the beginning of the end of this comfort food's reign, as frozen dinners saw their first decline in almost 60 years, a trend that's continued with only brief pauses since then. While the name might say egg, you won't find any yolks or whites in an egg cream or any cream for that matter. Instead, it has just three ingredients, whole milk, soda water, and chocolate syrup. What did you say, an egg cream? This sweet comfort drink is thought by some to have been invented in the 1880s, when a Yiddish theater star by the name of Boris Tomaszewski decided to recreate a chocolat at cream drink that he'd had in Paris. But most historians seem to agree that a Jewish candy store owner named Louis Oster actually invented the drink. He's also rumored to have regularly sold some 3,000 of his creations in a single day. The creator of the original egg cream took the recipe for his syrup to the grave. But most Brooklyn natives swear that the only way to make one today is Fox's You Bet Chocolate Syrup. While you can still find egg cream served in Brooklyn, they began to fade in popularity by the 60s and are largely unheard of outside of New York. Long before army soldiers dug into piles of creamed beef on toast, they were eating baked beans. This canned food staple first emerged around the Civil War. Then, sometime around the 1890s, someone had the idea to add chopped sausages to the mix, and thus a new comfort food was born. By 1980, beans and franks were widely available pre-made in cans. This combo was at one time such a staple of the American diet that it even had a holiday dedicated in its honor, as National Beans and Franks Day comes around every July 13th. But both of the main ingredients have taken a hit in recent years. The healthiness of hot dogs has especially been called into question many times in the past couple of decades. For example, in 2021, Researchers at the University of Michigan estimated that a single hot dog can shave 36 minutes off your life. You probably wouldn't consider eating turtles in any form to be comfort food, but not so long ago, turtle soup was considered a delicacy for the upper crust. It was so popular, in fact, that it practically wiped out an entire species. The diamondback terrapin was the turtle of choice for hardscrabble diners. Until it shifted from a subsistence food to an upper-class menu item in the mid-19th century. Sherry was a key ingredient, and when Prohibition hit, turtle soup went the way of the dodo. The terrapins eventually recovered, though more than half of all turtle and tortoise species remain endangered. 
Turtle soup eventually made a bit of a recovery, as it was found on menus as recently as the mid-20th century. But it's not exactly the easiest dish to prepare, owing in part to the difficulty of removing the shell and separating usable parts from the less desirable elements. Nowadays, it's seen as a strange delicacy in much of the Western world rather than anything resembling a comfort food. Am I not turtly enough for the turtle club? Is it steak, is it hamburger, or is it a little of both? Salisbury steak remains one of the lasting mysteries of 20th century comfort food trends, though it originated long before that. As reported by Smithsonian Magazine, Dr. James Salisbury believed that his chopped steak could cure chronic diarrhea in Civil War soldiers. By the time processed foods were becoming a staple of the American diet, Salisbury steak had found its way into TV dinners. But when TV dinners began waning in popularity in the mid-1980s, so too did the Salisbury steak. Since then, it's never regained its place in the world of comfort food. With much better fare available, a pulverized meat substance formed into a patty doesn't exactly scream comfort. Here's hoping it never makes a comeback. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Jello salad, an odd combination of name brand gelatin and just about anything you can find in the refrigerator, was a comfort food standard when Jello ruled the processed food world. There were variations for just about every taste or lack thereof. Onions, peppers, tuna, green olives, shrimp, carrots, spinach, and other various vegetables all somehow managed to get mixed together with this classic gelatin. With all these creative combinations circulating around domestic dining rooms, it's not too difficult to see what might have knocked Jell-O salad off the comfort food buffet. As it turns out, fish, vegetables, and meat suspended in reconstituted connective tissue ultimately aren't all that appetizing. Once cooler heads prevailed, Jell-O jiggled back to its previous self-proclaimed status as America's most famous dessert, and Jell-O salad became nothing more than a distant memory. Almost as controversial as the infamous Washington, D.C. hotel it's named for, Watergate salad was a picnic and potluck staple in the not-so-distant past. This combination of pistachio pudding mix, marshmallows, whipped cream, and pineapple topped with chopped nuts and cherries charmed visitors to the Watergate Hotel before making its way to deli counters and grocery stores across America. But now, it's disappeared just as much as a certain portion of former President Nixon's White House tapes. Well, I'm not a crook. If you think of Watergate salad as Ambrosia Salad's hipper younger sibling, then you can get a sense of why it had its moment. The name itself may be partly to blame for its downfall. The Watergate scandal made a mess of the American presidency that still reverberates to this day. But also, the waning popularity of Jell-O pudding mix and Jell-O salads is what really did this fluffy comfort food in. As a culinary relic that's best left in the past, Watergate salad is now a kitschy reference to the days when government conspiracies were just reserved for the tabloids. A heaping helping of one's popular Thanksgiving desserts seems to have fallen out of fashion over the years. These were, at one time, seen on Turkey Day tables across the country, or at least in certain regions. So consider trying some of these tasty vintage treats at your feast this Thanksgiving. Undoubtedly, this former staple of New England tables needs a new name. Maybe something like Molasses Delight, or how about a rum and vodka? The main ingredients are the base ingredients of rum and vodka, molasses and corn. But maybe that would make too many people think it's alcoholic. According to What's Cooking America, this dish has also been called Indian mush. But that's maybe even worse. In its earliest incarnation, which dates back to around 1796, this dessert was little more than a cornmeal mush with a dash of molasses added for sweetness. It has roots in an old-timey English dessert called Hasty Pudding that dates back to 1599. And if that doesn't sound appetizing in the least, don't worry, it gets better. Later recipes added things like raisins and spices, and in the handful of places where it's still served, it's often accompanied by vanilla ice cream. Since the pudding is served hot and the ice cream is cold, some have taken to calling it heaven and hell. That's not a bad name.
Massachusetts Plymouth Plantation is a living museum that focuses on life in the 17th century and has gone to the trouble of recreating some authentic dishes that would have been found on local tables in that era. According to Boston Magazine, they hold their own Thanksgiving celebrations with these authentic recipes, and one that sounds absolutely delicious is Narragansett Strawberry Cornbread. Strawberries were a well-known treat. They even got a shout-out in the journals of Massachusetts Bay Colony leader John Winthrop. But it was the Narragansett tribe that first mixed them into cornbread. There are a lot of cornbread recipes out there, and it really is as simple as mixing in some strawberries. Or, as a taste of history suggests, other dried berries. Just remember that if you're going authentic, it should be a recipe that doesn't use dairy or eggs. It's the perfect dessert for anyone who doesn't want to follow a heavy Thanksgiving meal with something overly sweet. But you can't have my cornbread, that's for damn sure. Because if you try to take my cornbread, part two of my killing spree gonna begin up in here on your ass right now. Pumpkin pie is hardly something that needs to make a comeback. It's THE Thanksgiving dessert, and it's not going anywhere. But this is the original, which looked pretty different. Settlers really weren't impressed with the idea of eating pumpkin and scorned the idea until scurvy set in. It was native people who showed them how to do something tasty with it. According to What's Cooking America, there was no crust. And for good reason. There were no ovens around that would have been capable of baking one. The process was likely just cutting the top off a pumpkin or other type of squash, taking out the innards, and baking it over an open fire. The Huffington Post reports that it would pretty quickly bake down into a version of pie. The pumpkin would have been sliced, and the inside would have been hot, tender, sweet, and delicious. It's easy to modernize, too. Use your oven and make sure you pick a pie pumpkin and not a carving pumpkin. The Guardian pondered whether the Jell-O salad was, quote, an American abomination or Thanksgiving treat. It's a fair question. We've all seen the cringeworthy pictures of various meats and veggies floating in gelatin from 1970s-era cookbooks. Serious Eats says that gelatin-based desserts were once reserved for the rich and famous. Gelatin required a chef's skill to make. But when Jell-O came on the scene at the turn of the 20th century, things changed. People went a little nuts. Jell-O salads with their jiggly exteriors and surprise fillings were once called America's most famous dessert. And look, we're not talking about reviving the monstrosities of old. This is a simple jello salad with cranberry and pineapple. Maybe cranberries and raspberries. Cranberry and orange? Add a layer of whipped cream and you'll have a sweet treat. Yep, there's always room for jello. <laughs> Nantucket cranberry pie is not precisely a pie in the typical sense. Instead of filling in a crust, it's basically a one-bowl cake-like batter poured over cranberries. It's baked until the cranberries turn soft, yet remain tart, and the cake becomes light and delicious. It's got all the flavors you want for Thanksgiving, and here's the bonus. It's nowhere near as heavy as a slice of pumpkin pie. Where did this amazing idea come from? According to Taste, the most popular recipe comes from a novelist named Laurie Colwyn. It was published in an issue of Gourmet magazine in 1993. And we hate to break it to you, but the 90s are officially old school. Abraham Lincoln is the president who declared Thanksgiving a national holiday. So what about enjoying a dessert right out of Mary Todd Lincoln's cookbook? Food blogger Tori Avey says Mrs. Lincoln's preferred cookbook was Miss Leslie's Complete Cookery. And nestled in its pages is a recipe for pumpkin pudding. Imagine a super moist dessert that's a cross between cake and pumpkin pie filling. And you've got the general idea. Miss Leslie's version was definitely decadent, served with a rich cream sauce and made with traditional pumpkin pie spices and a dash of rose water. The Thanksgiving we celebrate today doesn't have a whole heck of a lot in common with what America's earliest settlers would have done. Dory Avey says we can largely thank Sarah Josepha Hale for most of the traditions we observe. In 1827, Hale published a novel called Northwood, A Tale of New England. It includes a whole chapter about a Thanksgiving meal and the spread of roast turkey, stuffing, gravy, veggies, pies, and cranberry sauce sounded so good, it ended up being the blueprint for Thanksgiving dinners for decades after. So what better way to celebrate the mother of Thanksgiving than by bringing one of her desserts back to the table? It's an easy one, too. The recipe for her apple pudding was published in her 1841 book, Early American Cookery. And it's basically a sweet pudding made from stewed apples, lemon, brown sugar, cream, and eggs, then baked like a pie. What the heck is a sonker? 
According to Open Table, the idea of the sangar can be traced back to North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountains. It's basically a pie-like dessert made with a simple crust and filled with whatever was handy. It was a way to use and preserve everything in a crust that was easy to make with the most basic of ingredients. There's no one right way to make a sangar. But Epicurious says it's the sweet potato sangar that needs to make an appearance for Thanksgiving. It's got an impressive down-home pedigree, too. It's the favorite sangar in Mount Airy, North Carolina, the hometown of Andy Griffith. It's basically the official dessert of Mayberry. The first thing we do is plan a little dinner. In the mid-1940s, wartime rationing made it impossible to make many longtime favorites, and desserts were at the top of the list. Sugar was in short supply, and it's not dessert if it's not sweet, right? According to the Louisville Courier-Journal, those Thanksgivings were tough, and not only because of shortages. In 1945, the paper wrote, In spite of anxiety, in spite of the knowledge that families are mostly incomplete, we still mark the day on our calendar and try to give fully to continue the tradition in which we consciously give thanks for our many blessings. Those are somber thoughts. That same year, the food editor suggested a way in which cooks could, quote, fulfill the family dream of apple pie. And it's a delicious solution that needs to make a comeback. Instead of sugar, Marguerite T. Finnegan suggested using molasses, honey, or corn syrup as a sweetener. Her deep dish apple pie calls for a little more than half a cup of honey, and that sounds delicious. The turkey's done, the table is cleared, and the Thanksgiving dishes are in the sink. Everyone's filled to the brim, but this is the exact time that something hot, sweet, and comforting is just what everyone's craving. So why not heat up some Dr. Pepper? Sounds weird, right? Serious Eat says the idea was essentially created by Dr. Pepper's marketing team in the 1960s, and that pretty much explains everything. Cold drink sales tended to drop off during the holiday and winter months, and by advertising this hot and fizzy drink, they were hoping to boost their fourth quarter numbers. Yes, Dr. Pepper is delicious, cold or hot. It was popular for a while, and it's still popular in some pockets of the South, but it's largely faded from mainstream consciousness. Here's the big shock, though. It's better than you'd expect. It's just Dr. Pepper heated with a thin slice of lemon. It's great for the kids, and old advertisements thought of the grown-ups, too. They suggest adding a dash of rum for a drink they call the Boomer. Looking for a Thanksgiving dessert that everyone can share during the course of the evening? Something tasty, not too heavy, and without the commitment of an entire slice of pie? Even better, how about something with an old-timey name that you can snicker at now? Enter the Nut Snacker by Kraft & Blue Diamond. The basic idea is that it was a football-shaped hunk of cream cheese and mayo, mixed with flavor-enhancing ingredients like bacon and seasonings, then chilled. The nuts were layered along the outside to make it look a bit like a pinecone, and guests could snack away. In spite of the funny name, it's a solid idea. Click Americana says there were a number of recipes built around the same basic premise. Some use cheddar or Parmesan cheese as the base for the dip, which is also spiced with horseradish and Tabasco. You then place the nutty garnish on the outside. Put one of these on the coffee table while everyone's watching the game, and it'll be gone by halftime. Steamed cranberry pudding is a pudding in the British sense of the word. It's anything steamed in a container. According to British food history, the ancestors of the puddings we're suggesting you whip up this Thanksgiving were once a serious delicacy. They were sweet and spicy dishes, usually served as a part of the main meal, along with the side dishes. We save the sweet things for dessert now, and a recipe for steamed cranberry pudding, plucked from the pages of a cookbook written at a time when women were identified solely by their husbands' names, is just the right amount of sweet. The one Baltimore Fishbowl found was written by Mrs. A. Van Eerden, and it's a British pudding with a distinctly American twist. It's made with cranberries, molasses, cream, butter, and just a dash of vanilla, among other things. Then the super-thick mixture is poured into a can, and it's steamed rather than baked. It's delicious, different, and a nod to the place from which those original settlers hailed. For many, Thanksgiving is one of the few times of the year they see certain members of their families. And it can often be a reminder of why that is, whether it's the aunt who wants to know why you've made certain life choices, or the grandfather who's fond of remembering just how things were better in the old days before you were around. Boy, do we have a dessert for those folks. In 1957, the Monroe News Star ran a piece promising that the cranberry souffle salad was going to, quote, be the highlight of your meal. It was lauded as a fast luxury touch, and it could be made quickly by popping it into the freezing unit. The basics involve lemon gelatin, 
cranberry sauce, celery, and pineapple, all mixed and frozen together. Oh, and the surprise? There's a heck of a lot of mayonnaise mixed in there, too, with a footnote that, if you like, you can garnish it with more mayo before you serve. It hung around for a bit. Hellman's published its official recipe in 1958. It's exactly what you should make for that family member who's always speaking so fondly of the good old days. Just like in fashion, what was out always comes back around in the culinary world. We love finding ways to use retro food and modern recipes. And these are just a few of our favorite old school ingredients that are making a comeback. If there's one tinned food that's iconically vintage, it's got to be Spam. But far from being relegated to the back of a dusty cupboard, Spam's been making a spectacular comeback. Spam, 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 Baked Beans, Spam, 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 and Spam! Fans might argue that it never went away, but what's clear is that Spam in a can is having a moment. Prepare to be surprised by Spam's culinary glow-up. Since hitting the shelves in 1937, Spam is more popular than ever. Chefs are creating new Spam concoctions, often adding it to Asian dishes. The salty taste adds an umami zing, making it perfect for rice dishes. Try kimchi fried rice with Spam for extra tang from the fermented cabbage. Spam is widely used in Korea, but these days even U.S. foodies are eager to give it a second chance. Consider trying a Hawaiian-style Spam musubi recipe, combining the meat with white rice, a teriyaki glaze, and nori, or use it to make a one-of-a-kind poke bowl. It's the small things in life that make us feel connected, like scraping out a near-empty jar of Nutella and eating it straight from the spoon. The ultimate chocolate and hazelnut spread has been around for more than half a century. However, while it first appeared in stores in the U.S. in the 80s, it's really garnered an upsurge in fans in recent times. The recent passion for Nutella in the U.S. is, in part, thanks to TikTok. In 2022, the popularity of butterboards, remember those? Extended to Nutella boards. Imagine a board spread thick with Nutella and topped with sliced fruit, pretzels, candy, and marshmallows. Not just a condiment to spread on bread and toast, Nutella can be added to cakes and pastries. Try a Nutella cupcake or a Nutella cookie. From frosting to fillings, there are so many sweet somethings you can create with this nutty, chocolatey spread. Reach into the back of your cupboard and grab that can of mackerel fillets that's been gathering dust. Today, tinned fish is not only having a comeback, it's become downright trendy. When you think of seafood in a can, you think sardines, but there are a lot of other tinned fish in the sea. In the past, most tinned fish fans were of a certain age. But all of a sudden, hipster joints have tinned fish sections on their menu, and TikTok is flooded with hashtag tinned fish. In fact, U.S. canned fish sales went up by 9.7% in 2022, or about $2.7 billion. That's a ton of tins. Among the countless interesting ways you can serve it, you'll want to try making shared boards or seacuterie. Many tinned fish brands really stand out with their cool retro designs that look totes at home in a hipster bistro. Oily fish is a great ingredient to add to pizzas and frittatas. Or think outside the burger box and try making a salmon patty with tinned salmon, mayo, egg, and panko. Or what about pan-fried tuna burgers? Sounds fancy and delicious and cool. Cottage cheese has long been thought of as diet food. With its distinct taste and texture, it's a love-it-or-hate-it item. Some say it's watery and tasteless, whereas others find it light and creamy. Cottage cheese has been around since before the bell-bottom era, but it fell out of favor for a while. But cottage cheese is back, baby. Dennis, what is this enticing bowl of white? This? Charlie, that, that's cottage cheese. Cottage cheese? Like... She's from some cottage. Dairy companies are marketing the stuff to a hip new demographic, and modern recipes are embracing this versatile ingredient. 
For example, you can use it to make a creamy dip, add it to smoothies, or combine it with mashed potatoes. You can add spices to make a spread, or pair it with fruit and honey on crackers. You could substitute it for feta in a spinach pie with puff pastry, or throw it in the blender with oil, garlic, and herbs to make a decadent, creamy salad dressing. You can add cottage cheese to scrambled eggs, or simply spread it on toast with chopped cucumbers and dill as garnish. You could even turn it into a cheesecake-style dessert, add it to pancake batter, or use it to make pasta sauce. The only limit is your imagination. At over a century old, Velveeta seems positively ancient. This processed cheese has long been viewed as an old-fashioned ingredient, certainly not one that resonated with foodies of any age. When the pandemic began and lockdowns followed, Velveeta made a major comeback. Sales increased by a whopping 24% in 2020. Perhaps people needed it for all the comfort food they were cooking at home. Recognizing a new opportunity, the company cleverly marketed the cheese in fun ways, including an ad featuring a martini with a Velveeta rim and cheesy pasta shell garnish. It's called a Veltini, which means if you take the words Velveeta and martini and combine, combine them, that's what you get. If that doesn't appeal, then what about a meaty queso dip made with chorizo to serve with tortilla chips? The shelf-stable ingredient can even be used in the filling for old-school apple pies. If you're not keen about including it in your desserts, try a loaded potato soup made with bacon, broth, and heavy cream, along with potatoes and Velveeta, of course. What's great about this cheesy revival is that when you make a dish for your next dinner party using this nostalgic ingredient, everyone will think you're right on trend rather than stuck in the past. If you spend time on TikTok, you've probably noticed that 2023 has become the year of the pickle. I turned myself into a pickle, Morty! Boom! Big reveal! I'm a pickle! The trend is contagious. Before you know it, you'll be adding pickles to your pizza, making pickle slushies, or serving a pickleback shot in a pickle for the ultimate disposable beverage. Pickles with chamoy are popular, but you can also add slices to chocolate bites. Dill pickles are where it's at. They add a shot of umami to sweet and savory dishes. It's fun to see chefs take to social media to try new pickle pairings, and the possibilities seem to be endless. A jar of pickles used to be seen as nothing but a burger garnish, hardly a star ingredient. No longer. These days, they're in demand and supremely versatile. Pull out the air fryer for fried pickles. Try them with a cumin and smoked paprika panko coating. Then add a creamy ranch-style dip. Maybe make it with cottage cheese? Cutting edge and delicious. When was the last time you cooked anything with cornmeal? It's a classic ingredient that gets shoved in the back of the pantry after being used for one specific recipe. And cornmeal is gluten-free, which is great news for anyone with an intolerance or allergy. Cheap and easy cornmeal is often associated with the Great Depression, but the country's love of nostalgic foods is bringing it back front and center, often featured as cornbread. For a taste of the South, make some old-fashioned corn pones, which are small cornbread-style pancakes. You'll need cornmeal, obviously, plus some fat such as bacon dripping or vegetable oil. These little cakes are delicious with either sweet syrup or a savory stew, and everyone should try Southern-style shrimp and grits. You never heard of grits? Sure, sure, I heard of grits. I just actually never seen a grit before. With parmesan mixed into the cornmeal and lemon and parsley used to season the seafood, it's a real treat. Jell-O and other gelatin brands haven't disappeared, but they're not nearly as popular as they were back in the 70s and 80s. It just seemed like a fact when I was a kid. While some aspic and gelatin dishes of the past might look downright disgusting today, there's undoubtedly been a revival. LA-based Noonchi is giving jelly desserts an uber-trendy, artistic makeover with its Asian-inspired creations. The link between social media trends, art, and food is perfectly expressed through the visual appeal of jello. And let's not forget, 
it wiggles. Dessert? I didn't make dessert. Oh, instead, I made some fun. Try making fun glitter shots with champagne, or deep sea desserts with sour fish candies floating inside. Or hop in the time machine and combine jello with cake mix and Cool Whip for an old fashioned jello poke cake. Do you love the taste of jiggly jello with cream? Try creamy orange jello salad with cream cheese, whipping cream, and mini marshmallows, mixed with orange flavored jello and topped with mandarin slices. It's like something out of Mad Men, but super now at the same time. With a global market expected to be worth $1.09 by 2030, it's clear that the root beer fanbase is exploding. Popular producers such as Sprecher Brewing and Two Docks Brewing Company are riding a root beer wave that tops craft sodas and even alcoholic beers. When you think about the recent trends in food nostalgia, it's not surprising that this iconic drink reminiscent of diners and soda fountains is back in vogue. What about root beer? Root beer! If you haven't had it in a while, then you might be surprised by the sheer variety that's out there. Pick one. Then embrace the 1950s with a root beer float, or invent a new cocktail. Nowadays, root beer is increasingly used in marinades to add a sweet tartness to meats. The acidity helps tenderize meat for grilling. You can use it to add flavor to pulled pork, too, as the caramel notes complement smoky flavors. You can even add root beer when you're cooking short ribs. There's no doubt about it, cabbage is hardly beloved. However, back in the day, cabbage was everywhere, including crash diets consisting of nothing but cabbage soup. For some people, cabbage is relegated to bad memories of school canteens and a pale, overcooked and watery scoopful of vegetables. However, you can't keep a good veggie down, and cabbage is back and more popular than ever. The lockdowns of 2020 pushed the affordability, nutritional benefits, and versatility of cabbage into the social media spotlight. While it's often served as a side, it's also fantastic when it takes less of a leading role, adding fiber and texture to dishes. Or make it the hero in a crunchy cabbage salad with Napa and red cabbage varieties. Sesame oil, soy sauce, and peanut butter infuse it with an Asian flavor profile you'll love. Need inspiration? There are hundreds of cabbage recipes out there for you to try. You can thank TikTok foodies for the recent rise and popularity of instant ramen noodles. There's been a real interest in garnishing them with assorted ingredients to upgrade the dish. This is instant noodle. You know what else is instant noodle? The spaghetti in your pantry. It's the same thing. Among the ramen noodle hacks, the idea of adding an egg, grated garlic, and QP mayo really caught on. For optimal results, you'll want to whisk up the extra ingredients in a separate bowl first. Then add some of the noodle cooking water and the seasoning sachet. The result is a creamy ramen sauce you'll want to make on a regular basis. Though still super cheap, ramen noodles are no longer a basic meal, but a comeback ingredient for a whole range of enhanced dishes. Add cooked meat and veggies and create your own bowl with your desired consistency by adding more or less liquid. Finish it off by customizing the dish with garnishes and other toppings. If you're low on ideas, make David Chang's Momofuku ramen with a twist by combining veggies, tofu, and bamboo shoots with the noodles, and topping the bowl with green onions, nori, and a poached egg. Back in the day, buttermilk was produced on farms across the U.S. that churned their own cream to make butter. The liquid that was left over was traditionally made into buttermilk. However, cultured buttermilk today often consists of milk with cultures added. While it was once an everyday dairy product, it became less common in modern times. However, the acidity of buttermilk makes it the perfect ingredient for reactions in baked good recipes, helping muffins rise, for example. The versatility of buttermilk as an ingredient has really brought it to the attention of the contemporary home chef. Buttermilk drinking contest! Buttermilk is used to make a thick batter for crispy frying, and even as a salad dressing ingredient. It has a sour, tangy taste, and appeals to anyone who likes to keep their sugar intake down, since it has less lactose than milk. Don't just associate this ingredient with pancakes and fried chicken. It's way more complex than that. If you have a sweet tooth, whip up a buttermilk pie. Lemon, vanilla extract, and nutmeg give the buttermilk filling a zesty tang within a pastry case. 
From banana bread, coffee cake, and the wildly popular sourdough, to s'mores and donuts, here are some of the biggest old-school baked goods that either roared back to popularity or got even more popular than they already were during the COVID era of 2020 and 2021. It's impossible to talk about recent bakery trends without first addressing the great sourdough explosion of 2020. One of the most immediate fads that emerged following the first COVID-related lockdowns and shelter-at-home protocols was an almost obsessive trend of sourdough bread baking, not just across the nation, but around the world. According to Refinery29, Google searches for bread recipes hit a record high in March of the year that brought us COVID-19, and Canadian bread baker Ashley Turner welcome students from as far as Australia to her online sourdough courses. Bakeries sold or even gave away their long cultivated sourdough starters and millions of home bakers got in on the trend. Turner told Global News, I think what happened was you couldn't get yeast anywhere in the grocery store and that's what people are used to baking with. I think a lot of people wanted to get back to the basics and cooking in their kitchens, cooking for their families. And this was one of the ways to do that. Though they originated in Poland, bagels have long been associated with two places, New York and Montreal. But with a classic bagel spot in New York City made famous by Seinfeld shuttering pre-pandemic, compounded by the fall from grace of Instagrammable rainbow bagels, the round bread has been well overdue for a makeover. Bagels on the house. Enter the California bagel. To hear the New York Times of all outlets tell it, California bagel makers are driving a great bagel boom, producing some of the most delicious versions around. And California isn't the only place outside of New York where bagel bakers are finding room to shine. Thanks in part to a rise in bagel consultants and the debunking of the myth that New York water was what made Manhattan's bagels so special, bagels are experiencing a resurgence all over the U.S. That's happening both in professional bakeries and at home, as Jason Diamond explored with experiments in home bagel making for food and wine. While one subset of the population has taken advantage of the COVID-19 era in really getting their hands dirty with ambitious baking projects at home, another group has fled in the opposite direction. Being home all day and becoming their own baristas, cafeteria lunch ladies, and restaurant chefs has led some to seek out simpler baked goods. What better tool for those tired of being chained to the range than to rely on the tricks their grandmothers used? Much as housewives of the 50s and 60s relied on convenience foods, so too are modern cooks taking advantage of shortcuts, like boxed cake mixes, to bake something with the appeal of homemade, minus all the effort. Mm. Oh, that is terrific. Just terrific. A 2021 market report revealed that high sales growth for cake mixes is likely to continue until 2027. And it's no surprise, boxed mixes aren't just delicious on their own. They also make a great base for poke cakes, mug cakes, and more. Some companies have even launched luxury cake mixes to combine the ease of store-bought with the high quality that millennial home cooks crave. Banana bread has long been a bake sale fave, thanks not only to its ease of prep and deliciousness, but also to the fact that it naturally helps you use up food that might otherwise be wasted. Maybe it's the combination of culinary nostalgia and increased attention to pandemic-era food waste that contributed to the increasing popularity of banana bread in 2020. Whatever the reasons, during lockdown, searches for banana bread recipes online skyrocketed a whopping 525%. And to hear Southern Living tell it, the banana bread trend only continued after 2020. The 2021 spin, according to the magazine, turning the tender quick bread into a decadent grilled cheese by sandwiching luscious brie cheese between two tender slices of toasted banana bread. Much like banana bread, bread pudding is an old-school staple designed with reducing food waste in mind. Up to 40% of food is wasted in America, according to experts, and during the pandemic, with staples like pasta and rice flying off the shelves, even more attention was paid to this essential issue plaguing the nation. Luckily, bread pudding is a delicious solution to the problem. Made by soaking bits of leftover stale bread in a custard and then baking until creamy and set, bread pudding is a nostalgic favorite that's a popular way to quote upcycle stale bread according to the guardian bread pudding can be sweet as with cherry pecan bread pudding or savory as with a version pairing seasonal artichokes with gooey cheddar cheese either way it's a tasty treat that has thankfully come back into vogue whether you grew up on homemade or entomans 
Coffee cake was likely a constant throughout your childhood, and now it's back in full force. Just like banana bread, coffee cake is a quick, easy recipe to assemble with just a handful of pantry staples, boasting the added bonus of a sweet, crumbly topping that's deceptively simple to make. Jimmy Fallon is responsible for the cake's 2021 ascent to reclaimed fame as he documented tasting the locally famous iteration from New Jersey's BNW Bakery on his Instagram. In business since 1948, the bakery sells almost 2,000 pounds of the cake every week, and it ships nationwide. So when Fallon filmed himself trying the delightful cinnamon-spiked cake with his daughters, he created fans of the Hackensack staple all around the country. And if that wasn't enough of a reason to revitalize this classic, one 100-year-old Scott credited a daily slice of coffee cake for being the secret to her longevity. The pleasure of digging into a slice of perfectly tangy lemon cake cannot be denied. The famous treat recently soared in popularity when, in the wake of her eye-opening 2021 interview with Oprah, Meghan Markle baked up a lemon and olive oil cake as a thank you to volunteers distributing meals she and husband Prince Harry donated to hungry Chicagoans. That lemon drizzle cake is a favorite of the queen and is perhaps further proof that the beloved monarch was not at the heart of Markle's beef with the royal family. Markle alleged made the cake with lemons from her own California garden, another on-trend choice during the pandemic, when seed packets and soil bags flew off the shelves. Martha Stewart, meanwhile, united two on-trend baked goods by mashing up lemon cake and coffee cake in a recipe perfect for spring. Los Angeles-based Pudu Pudu recently sought to revamp Pudding's Rep with an Instagrammable Venice Beach shop peddling puddings boasting superfood ingredients like turmeric and pomegranate and, of course, a few plant-based options. Butterfly in the Sky had already become a popular flavor by early 2021 with its bourbon vanilla pudding, spirulina, banana cacao powder, chocolate curls, and edible jasmine blossom. Florian Schneider, managing director of Dr. Edgar Hospitality, Pudu Pudu's parent company, told Santa Monica Daily Press, the feedback so far is very positive. Everybody knows pudding from his or her childhood, but playing with all of these flavors makes it a very exciting experience for them. Campfire favorite s'mores are experiencing a resurgence that's evident in new product launches from top brands in 2021. Jet Puffed released s'mores flavored marshmallow bites to tide you over until your next cookout, while Hershey's expanded licensing for its s'mores branded tools and accessories to help you perfect your marshmallow and chocolate sandwiches. Ernie Savo, senior director of global licensing at Hershey's, told All on Georgia, consumers are continuing to find moments of goodness in simple activities like family s'mores nights and backyard celebrations. We're proud that our iconic brands have a place in these moments, and we're eager to create partnerships that extend that relationship from our snacking portfolio to a complete experience. Over in the UK, posh grocery chain Marks & Spencer launched an oh-so-instagrammable s'mores brownie you can even bake in the oven at home. And for the home cook, the Wall Street Journal featured a from-scratch, ginger-spiked, boozy s'mores recipe that revitalizes the classic. If you're not from the South, chances are you've never heard of this spiced pineapple and banana scented cake with cream cheese frosting. Once one of the most popular cakes for home bakers, Hummingbird Cake's popularity fell somewhat to the wayside in the late 20th century. Martha Stewart attributed the fall from grace to the fact that the original is just too sugary for some. With Vice reporting a rise in desserts that were, quote, not too sweet in 2020, it was time for a makeover, and Stewart delivered. Her revamped version relies on better-for-you coconut sugar to add just the right amount of sweetness to the moist base. The appeal of gargantuan foods is no secret, with giant pizzas, burgers, and more regularly making the news. But while cinnamon rolls are known for their big cinnamon flavor, it wasn't until recently that one in Ames, Iowa became known for its size as well. The two-pound, ten-dollar cinnamon rolls at barbecue restaurant Cornbread soared to popularity in March of 2021, when a Facebook photo of a server holding two, quote, giganto rolls went viral. By March 20th, as the Ames Tribune reports, the post had reached more than 1 million Facebook users, and Cornbread Facebook page followers more than doubled. You don't need to venture to Iowa to try these rolls either. A Washington Post journalist shared her experience baking them with her son at home. Yet another example of home cooks revitalizing a nostalgic bakery favorite. 
Old-fashioned donuts used to be a staple of diners and coffee shops, but today, on-trend donuts hail from a major chain, Krispy Kreme. As the vaccine rollout progresses through the U.S., Krispy Kreme has promised a free donut to anyone who can present a vaccination card, while the chain has been offering an Oreo-glazed version since April. Dunkin' Donuts, meanwhile, while not offering free donuts, certainly contributed to donuts' increased rise in popularity, with more than 40 vegan donuts joining their menu offerings recently. Given the ever-increasing popularity of plant-based diets, this step can give Dunkin' its piece of the donut pie. Are you ready to take your steak dinner to the next level? While your wedge salad might not be the best match for your steak dinner, the right seafood may be the perfect catch. Steak Diane is a meaty offering that's often thought of as a remnant of a bygone era. It may feature old-school ingredients, but it can still be considered relevant, especially at steak restaurants. It may not be the prettiest dish on the menu, but if you like to smother your meat and sauce, this is the most wonderful pairing you can go for. Steak Diane incorporates a juicy steak doused in a silky smooth butter-based sauce. It's sautéed with shallots and boosted with a splash of Worcestershire sauce, some Dijon mustard, and a touch of brawny cognac. A hefty dose of freshly ground pepper is the essential touch to the sauce that nicely counterbalances all the sweet, rich, and earthy flavors. The sauce derives from a French culinary tradition, and though it was originally served with venison, it eventually found its ideal pairing in beef. You'll usually find it on top of tender filet mignon, but it pairs nicely with any steak cut. A wedge of iceberg salad doused in blue cheese and garnished with bits of fried bacon is certainly an old-school classic. Alas, it has many downsides, including that big chunk of iceberg lettuce itself. Simply put, this isn't exactly the best variety of lettuce around. It may be satisfyingly crispy, but when it comes to nutrition, this salad doesn't offer much. And with a rather neutral flavor profile, you get a pretty bland and tasteless veggie. You might think the blue cheese would help, but it somehow only makes it even worse. It tends to ruin all the crispiness, resulting in a chunk of flavorless wilted greens. Furthermore, the intense aroma and flavor completely takes over the whole thing. The crisp bacon bits may be the best part of this classic, but they don't really get the chance to shine through. Iceberg, right ahead! Thank you. Oysters Rockefeller consists of a meaty oyster topped with a mix of butter, breadcrumbs, and herbs, all served on a half shell. It's all baked until the breadcrumbs crisp up, allowing those buttery and herbal flavors to mingle with briny oyster juices. Invented at Antoine's restaurant in New Orleans, this dish has a venerable history, dating back to 1899. Though the original recipe has never been disclosed, it has been recreated by numerous establishments nationwide. If executed properly, Oysters Rockefeller makes for quite the exquisite meal. The buttery and herbaceous breading is the perfect complement to the juicy tartness of the oysters. All the flavors come through effortlessly, but none sticks out too much. Plus, the dish is also difficult to mess up, as most restaurants usually have reliable, long-standing recipes, so you can expect a well-executed dish without any unpleasant surprises. You may have heard that spinach is packed with wonderful vitamins and nutrients, but when it comes smothered in cream, butter, flour, and sometimes a hefty amount of cheese, the end result is the opposite of wholesome. Creamed spinach is packed with fat and calories, so if you want a slightly lighter option at a steakhouse, we're sorry to say this ain't it. On top of all that, creamed spinach doesn't take long to cook, but you can never be sure if it was made fresh, and there's nothing worse than reheated greens. In 2021, Mashed conducted a survey to discover which side order at Outback Steakhouse ranks as the least favorite among guests. Unsurprisingly, creamed spinach topped the list, with 38% naming it as the worst option. We have to assume that the feelings are similar at other steakhouses. Steaks go well with various sides, but most of us can probably agree that nothing beats baked or mashed potatoes. But those options are also too predictable and just plain uninspiring. Steak should obviously be the star of the main course, but you should pair it with something stimulating and flavorful. That's where twice-baked potatoes come in. Twice-baked potatoes combine the best of both worlds. On the bottom, you have a nice crispy shell topped with a heap of creamy mash, usually loaded with cheese, green onions, and bacon. This retro classic will never go out of style, as it can easily be adapted with any topping. You can keep it as simple as possible or turn it into an extravaganza by adding trendy or deluxe ingredients. Twice-baked potatoes are sturdy and reheat well, so you can be sure that you'll never get a sad, cold spud. Potatoes! Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. If you thought that shrimp cocktails had disappeared from the culinary landscape, then you'll sadly be surprised to find out that steakhouses still proudly offer this questionable pairing of cold shrimps and tomato-based sauce. 
The history of the shrimp cocktail is shrouded in mystery, but it likely evolved from similar seafood specialties that were served as snacks and sometimes even drinks, which explains the cocktail moniker. In the U.S., you'll often see the sauces served inside a goblet or a cocktail glass with shrimps hanging loosely on the side. But we can't think of any good reason why anyone would want to smother delicate shrimp meat with a spicy ketchup-like sauce. Classic cocktail sauce combines ketchup, horseradish, chili, Worcestershire sauce, and various spices and seasonings. That results in something salty, spicy, and very aromatic that might be an excellent option in other contexts, but it's usually too powerful for buttery, delicate shrimp meat. The sauce could also be a red flag at seafood restaurants, as it can easily disguise poor quality and lack of flavor. The same thing can be said for steakhouses, which generally sell less seafood than steak, but if you do insist on ordering something fishy, definitely reel in another catch. French onion soup is a comforting classic that uses only a handful of ingredients to create an outstanding dish. It all starts with a heap of sliced onions sautéed in butter until they're thoroughly caramelized. They're then doused in a rich beef broth that gives this soup a firm backbone that can support all the sweet and caramel flavors. It's portioned and topped with toasted bread slices and finally sealed with grated cheese and broiled until the cheese melts and creates a gooey layer on top. Just by hearing this description, it should already be clear that French onion soup should be your regular order at a steakhouse. In addition to being incredibly delicious, it's a restaurant staple, as the preparation usually takes too much time and effort to make at home. But in a restaurant setting, it can be prepared well in advance. It's quickly finished in the oven, so it always comes to your table with a warm, cheesy crust that easily breaks into all that flavorful broth hidden underneath. Here, have some French onion soup. Despite its enduring popularity, filet mignon is one of those gourmet cuts that's actually a bit overrated. It's usually one of the most expensive options on a steakhouse menu, but that high price generally doesn't reflect the amount of flavor packed inside. Filet mignon is a small cut that comes from just one part of the tenderloin. As such, it's relatively rare. Though it's generally soft and tender, the flavor isn't so great, as it's too lean and doesn't have much juicy fat tissue. Filet mignon can make an excellent pairing with sauces or some added ingredients that will boost the flavor. But if you want to munch down on a delicious piece of beef without any additional components, this isn't your best option. Instead, go for steaks that have more marbling, such as a ribeye or the classic T-bone. Well, I am just a T-bone kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> Love that T-bone! <laughs> Oscar-style steak is one of those lavish, over-the-top options that are too beautiful to pass up. This gourmet order will get you a thick slab of steak, usually tenderloin, topped with crab meat and served with a generous drizzle of butter-based sauce. That juicy crab meat is occasionally replaced with lobster in the more luxe version. And when it comes to sauces, traditional options include thick and velvety hollandaise or classic bernaise that's packed with shallots and tarragon. You can say that this dish is fit for royalty, and appropriately enough, it was named after a king. That inspiration was Oscar II, who ruled Sweden during the 19th century and was reportedly a fan of quirky and luxurious combos such as this one. Considering steakhouses are a bit decadent as is, Oscar-style steak perfectly understands the assignment. If you want some gastronomic decadence, then this is the ultimate order. So go all out and treat yourself with this surf and turf combo that screams extravagance. Surf and turf is a culinary concept that proves how unconventional land and sea pairings can work in perfect harmony. However, when it comes to surf and turf, Clams Casino simply does not hit the jackpot. This dish most likely originated at the turn of the 20th century at the Narragansett Pier Casino in Rhode Island, with Julius Keller usually credited as the creator. But nowadays, Clams Casino is a rare sight on menus, though it remains popular at some seafood joints and Italian-American restaurants. You'll occasionally find it at classic steakhouses, but you should still skip it, despite the venerable history. Clams Casino isn't a very complicated dish. It consists of little neck clams served on a half shelf topped with a mix of breadcrumbs, butter, peppers, and bacon. Variations include different seasonings, grated cheese, or even a slice of bacon perched on each clam. The assembled shell is broiled until the breadcrumb topping sets and the bacon crisps up. Individually, each of these elements sounds appetizing, but the combination is ultimately a bit off. The flavor of the clams certainly can't come through the bready pepper topping and the smoky bacon, so the idea of pairing these overpowering elements with the juicy sweetness of the shellfish is just plain wrong. Baked Alaska has everything you want in a dessert — cake, ice cream, and airy meringue to top it all off. The soft sponge base is sturdy enough to support the generous amount of ice cream mounted on top, 
while the thick layer of caramelized meringue provides a creamy, feather-light element as a great finishing touch. The best thing about Baked Alaska is the array of flavor combinations, ranging from fruity and light to all-chocolate heavyweights. In addition to the flavor profile, Baked Alaska always steals the show as a visually attractive dessert that can easily be the centerpiece conclusion to any meal. And I say, I don't know, Alaska. The only problem is that Baked Alaska is usually challenging to prepare, especially if you choose to make it from scratch. But this is precisely why you should order it when dining out. As it's already partially frozen, you don't have to worry that the cake will be stale or underwhelming. For our money, there's no better way to finish a steakhouse dinner than with ice cream coated in warm, caramelized meringue. Calamari is a lovely Italian term for squid, but in the United States, it's mainly used to describe an appetizer of breaded, deep-fried squid rings. This classic dish is one of the most common seafood options at traditional steakhouses. If prepared correctly, it results in a wonderful combination of soft squid meat and crispy golden crust. Add a creamy sauce on the side and a squeeze of lemon juice, and you've got yourself a fantastic seafood dish. But the problem at most steakhouses is that calamari is offered as a starter, meaning that you'll munch down on a heap of fried seafood before you even get to the main event. Squid is theoretically pretty nutritious, but that's not exactly the case anymore when you cover it in flour and drown it in copious amounts of oil. It may be delicious, but it's certainly not an order you want to make before digging into some protein-packed steak, not to mention all the sides and desserts on the docket. A fizzy drink with an explosive history, a 90s New York fave, and a lavender cocktail so breezy, you'll want to take to the skies. One thing's for sure, these aren't your parents' weekend wine coolers. The Greyhound Cocktail is the potent and passionate communion of grapefruit and vodka. While its salmon pink presentation may scream trendy, the cocktail got its recorded start back in the 1930s, when grapefruits were all the rage. Though primarily a vodka cocktail nowadays, this drink was originally served with gin. Nowadays, it really does boil down to taste when ordering a Greyhound. While vodka may be the fallback for this cocktail, with the re-emergence of gin in pop culture, maybe the OG Greyhound will soon be rearing its head again. In the meantime, there are plenty of recipes to scratch any itch. Whip up a fun Polynesian punch. One part maraschino cherries, one part fresh orange juice, and a dash of gin. Looking to pour one out in celebration of the country's history? Look no further than with Fish House Punch, a boozy beverage that claims George Washington himself among its many connoisseurs, according to Atlas Obscura. The exact recipe remained a tight-lipped secret for a very long time, and even nowadays, there's a lot of variation on how to best make Fish House Punch. Really, the consensus is to mix with grandeur and gusto. Fizzy wine, cognac, rum, orange pico tea, peach schnapps, sugar, pineapple, bourbon, and champagne are all elements that can be combined to make this fierce mixture. If Fish House Punch should be one thing, it should be, above all else, strong. The punch is traditionally accompanied by an extremely large block of ice. But one final note, it should never be served with whiskey, as that was not the drink of a proper gentleman. The Corpse Reviver No. 2 is anything but subtle. It was at one point considered a mean hangover cure, according to the Phoenix New Times. When looking at the cocktail, it's hard to believe it could be described so potently. Its pale yet bright yellow color and delicate garnish come off as chic, not threatening. Just one look at the historical recipe provided by Difford's Guide is enough to confirm how this drink could shake life back into just about anything. A glass mixed with one part lemon juice, Lillet Blanc, Cointreau, dry gin, and a dash or rinse of absinthe a perfect option for mixing up a spooky cocktail for Halloween. Mint juleps are a southern staple, synonymous with the Kentucky Derby, where a mind-boggling 120,000 mint juleps are served on average, according to Town & Country. The name julep actually comes from a Middle Eastern drink, which eventually made its way to the Mediterranean, where the rose petals were replaced with mint. This is where the American mint julep cocktail takes inspiration and utilizes fresh mint leaves, simple syrup, bourbon, and lots of crushed ice. It's not quite clear just when and why the mint julep made it to the U.S., but it was made the official drink of the Kentucky Derby in 1938. Another southern wonder, the Sazerac, might be a bit more obscure than the mint julep, but that doesn't make this drink any less appetizing. The Sazerac traces its roots down to New Orleans, where the cocktail was first conceived in an apothecary. While the recipe's brandy has long been substituted for the more down-home whiskey, the Sazerac remains decidedly New Orleans in nature, partially due to the dash of absinthe that was added late into the 19th century. You can't ignore the Cosmo, its iconic color, its unique sweet yet tart flavor, and its presentation in a classy martini glass. 
The cocktail first got its start in San Francisco, where it began as a sort of kamikaze variant with a dash of cranberry juice to beautify it. The drink soon made its way over to the East Coast and arguably found its home there. The modern iteration of the Cosmo is credited to mixologist Toby Cicchini, who took the bare bones of the recipe and tightened it with Cointreau, Absolute Citron, and fresh lime juice. While the drink's heydays in the late 80s and early 90s have long passed, its revival on screen has landed it in the annals of pop culture history. The name Sidecar has very little to do with the drink itself and more of its origins. Well, allegedly. An entry in Difford's Guide claims the name owes itself to the cocktail's alleged creator, who would often ride in a motorcycle sidecar on his way to the bar. It's said, although debated, that the cocktail was first conceived abroad during Prohibition, albeit in an American-style cocktail bar. I don't want to strike you, barkeep, but I will break up this den of vice. Den of vice? Sidecars are a thrilling combination of cognac, triple sec, orange liqueur, and a twist of lemon juice to nail the landing. Chilled Magazine romantically describes the cocktail as a rich honey-colored drink, which is sure to add both some color and relief during those hot summer nights. No, not the martini, the Martinez. As Difford's Guide points out, when looking at lineage, it becomes clear that the Martinez itself evolved from the Manhattan. In other words, the Manhattan led to the Martinez, which led to the martini. If that wasn't confusing enough, there's two schools of thought when preparing this classic cocktail, the dry or sweet Martinez. A Martinez cocktail is at its best and brightest when balanced. The drink calls for gin, vermouth, either sweet or dry, bitters, and orange curacao, which lends to a bold taste and color. The French 75 might be on the cusp of a renaissance. This fizzy drink first got its start after World War I. It was named after the French cannon that was helping hold the country's offensive against Prussia, so it comes as no surprise that this cocktail carries a special sort of hit to it. The French 75 is an easy-to-make cocktail, where gin is shaken together with lemon and a little sweetener, then topped with a bit of the bubbly. As one recipe from Tasting Table observes, the shaken gin does a lot to ease its potency. It can also be made as a non-alcoholic cocktail, meaning this will make everyone at the dinner table feel part of the party. The Tom Collins cocktail started with the joke. Around the late 19th century, it became a prank, especially in New York, to convince someone that Tom Collins was spreading rumors about them, and thus, the tongue-in-cheek Tom Collins cocktail found its name. A Tom Collins cocktail was classically made with gin, a bit of lemon, gum arabic syrup, and ice shaken together. A bit of sparkling water animated that entire affair, and these days, the drink is generally served in a tall tumbler with a different sweetener and a flare of lemon, orange, and cherry garnishes. First coming to the bar around the end of the 19th century, according to Difford's Guide, the Bronx belongs to the series of cocktails named after New York City's esteemed boroughs. The orange cocktail uses both sweet and dry vermouth of equal quality and pairs it with gin, orange juice, and bitters. Use fresh orange juice to make a more vibrant and refreshing refreshment and a gin with a citrus base like Hendrix Gin to bring out the best in this already great cocktail. At the end of the day, the Bronx is a pretty cocktail with a pretty flavor under the right conditions. The Bee's Knees is a mix of lemon, honey, orange juice, and, for the buzz, gin, as Difford's Guide explains. Always shaken and sometimes given an orange zest garnish, this smooth yet zesty cocktail is a classic that should not be left to the annals of time and a Prohibition era start. Opt for chamomile or herb-infused gins to add a wonderful and fresh dimension to the drink and keep it from getting too sweet. Be sure to find high-quality honey and shake raw honey with the juices before shaking in gin. This will keep the Bee's Knees buzzing. The Gin Ricky remains the capital of the nation's capital and a much-celebrated cocktail unique to the District of Columbia. Legend has it that the cocktail was created in the late 19th century to combat the characteristically humid mid-Atlantic summer. While originally made with rye, the Gin Ricky overtook the original whiskey rye Ricky. According to Imbibe, the Gin Ricky is made with gin, of course, freshly squeezed lime, and soda water. It's always served on ice. While the rest of the country may not know this drink by name, the city holds it dearly. The last word is a classic story of balance. It's made with gin, green chartreuse, lime juice, and maraschino liqueur in the perfect ratio as punch drink notes. The flavors that define this cocktail are big and need to be in perfect harmony for the last word to be palatable. The last word isn't for the meek, it's for risk takers who delight in big payoffs. Some may even be surprised at just how refreshing this drink can be. While not quite in the mainstream, the last word saw a revival in Seattle, perhaps because of the challenge for both those behind and in front of the bar. But what makes the last word so fascinating is the fact that it's so unique. Indeed, for ardent admirers, the last word has the last laugh. Son, there's no wrong way to consume alcohol. The Aviation Cocktail is one of those drinks that is as beautiful as it is delicious, an enchanting lavender mix that makes a breezy companion to humid summer nights. Creme de Violette liqueur is responsible for the drink's iconic color and also for its relative obscurity. It can be something of an acquired taste, 
It's traditionally mixed with gin, maraschino, and freshly squeezed lemon. This makes for a really well-balanced cocktail with floral and fruity notes and a refreshing twist of lemon. Do heed this warning, though. Be careful when mixing in the creme de violette, as it has the potential to overwhelm the recipe and make it too floral. Don't ruin an otherwise perfect drink. This is the wrong way to consume alcohol.